Hey, it looks like we made it. We made it. Hello, Michelle. Hello, David. <laughs> David Villegas. <laughs> become one of my favorite pianists and composers, I have to tell you. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you. That really means a lot. Thank you. It's really, really wonderful to, uh, you know, just be able to, to chat, you know, having seen you so long. And uh, of course, we're all missing the, the Midnight Room at the same, you know, where I used to see you all the time. And, you know, so it's, just, it's nice to, to reconnect with you. Yeah. And, you know, on the next level, because we, you know, we have things in common that have brought us into each other's realms. But I feel Much like, so. uh, yeah. And when, once we decided to do this, we kind of really jumped in and it's been really great just really listening to your music and getting to know you beyond what I knew. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same, same for me, you know, it's been, it's been a nice process of uh, discovery, you know, just getting into your music and, uh, you know, having a, a little bit, a little bit more, uh, you know, this gave me an opportunity to, to really just kind of dig in, you know, into, into more, you know, more of your work that I wasn't familiar with. So, so thank you. Yes, it's great. Yes, yeah, so uh, I mean, I'm just so taken with your your uh, your aesthetic, your dynamic, your like the spectrum of of what you do. Which uh, you know, I was thinking it's like from a from a, a place, a complete tranquil, peaceful, like nowhere to get kind of place, all the way to one's worst nightmare kind of vibe. <laughs> 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 exactly it's like every you know every, everything you know life both, yeah yeah and i know we both you know we're both geared really spiritually and mm -hmm. uh and and these are the things that exist and um for the music to express it all is beautiful mm -hmm. you know so yeah i really dug into some of your music to where there's certain things i want to ask you about about certain songs and things like that but may, maybe um maybe you can start with uh or something, but I I just want to say, uh, you know, you're so thoughtful. You're uh, you're so pianistic. Um, you play the whole instrument, and to me, a lot of people play a lot of notes, but it's the sound of one's instrument that, if that motivates what you play, it's a different kind of way of playing. Indeed, the, the purpose, the purpose behind, you know, the 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 sonics. Yeah, the sonics. Yeah. I mean, yeah. look, piano, I was like, piano, wow, what an instrument. What a world, what a world. Uh, I tell students sometimes, you know, that's nice, but I don't really feel you hearing your sound or bringing out the possibilities of, of what you could could do given what a piano is. It's like, the vibration like, of the instrument. Yeah, there's you know, all the strings in the wood. I mean, all those things have like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Echo? You have an echo? You hear an echo? I don't have, no, I don't hear an echo, no. You hear something? Just me. Yeah. On my end. Okay. Anyway. Yeah, so tell me what you've been thinking about. Well, you know, I, I was really I was really um intrigued by the um by the scope, you know, of, of your work, you know, and also you know, aesthetically, you know, it's very, it's, it's, it's very broad, but there seems to be a, a con obviously a connection, you know, an aesthetic and a creative connection between between all the different projects, you know, that 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 you've um, that you've been developing for so many years. You know, one thing I, I was really, you know, I guess I would start. Let's start from the beginning. You know, you send me. Um, a recording, which you told me was the very, very first recording that you that you were um, um, featured on, and it was something that, um, to me, reminded me of, of, you know, like some of the sound that was that was uh, popular in Cuba in the, you know, like around the time when I was born, you know, in the eighties, you know, like it, it, it brought memories back of um, the sound of groups like El Ritmo Oriental and and also Los Bamban, you know, from specifically from that from that period, you know. Um, so, so more exactly, exactly. So, and you know, I I, I noticed also the the uh, the similarity in the in the format, which which was a charanga, and um, 
And I, you know, I just wanted to to ask you, what was your your introduction to the music uh, here? You know, in 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 the culture of New York. What what was? How do you get introduced to to that type of music? And what was your your relationship to it at first? And how do you how do you um, come in contact with 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 the musicians that were making that kind of music in New York at that time? It's interesting because I have the same kind of thoughts of things I want to ask you about what you took so deep into, uh, I'll answer this, but just to say what you took so deep into this uh, jazz world, but from the perspective that you, that you have and play. But for me, it started, you know, uh, I started playing piano when I was six uh, in Oakland, California, where I'm from. And, um, in my home, I heard a lot of lot of um, what they call world music today, but it was just uh, uh, traditional music from around the world that had a a spiritual uh, impetus and vibe and nature, and I was just really drawn to that. I heard a lot of that, a lot of traditional jazz, and a whole lot of R and B and funk, because I came up in the '60s and the '70s, and and I came to New York in 1978. So when I was um, about 18, I, start, I, I, took a, I walked in on a, a class on Afro-Cuban percussion. And um, that's where, and I say it probably too much, but it's really, that's where my, my path was really born. And I didn't realize it then because I was already deep into jazz and improvisation and, and, uh, and playing piano. But that's when I started playing percussion and studying with... Uh, with masters of uh, uh, Cuban folklore traditions. So that's where it started for me. Uh, and from that moment on, it was about discovery. Uh, they were really parallel wor worlds at the time. You know, it really wasn't many overlaps. I mean, historically, there are, you know, projects that obviously were heading in that direction. And, and long before I tuned into them, they existed. But I didn't know anybody into both. And uh, so, but then I started seeing parallels. So uh, I'm playing, I'm, I'm listening to Los Papines and Los Muñequitos and um, Conjunto Folklorico. And uh, really just, you know, trying to get the, the Matanza and Havana styles of, of Wawanko and Rumba and uh, surrounding myself with other percussionists, none of who were really into jazz. But meanwhile, I'm starting to just hear it all together. And, and uh, by the time I got here, I was I was having um, sonic uh, dreams of of these meetings of the worlds, and my first uh, contacts here were of both worlds. Uh, and my percussion teachers sent me here to Jean Golden because they grew up together here in New York. And uh, you know, any story could take up this whole half hour, so I'm gonna keep it moving. But um, that Los Kimi record. Uh, which is Songo, Charango with Paquito de, Paquito de Rivera on flute and um, Vicente Sanchez on congas, Juan Wurst on bass, people that we know and others might know. Uh, I was at a tambor, actually, and a group of guys walked in that was Kimi and Vicente and some others. They We got to talking. They needed a piano player. I went to rehearsal. Um, that's how that started. And uh, I played with that group for a long time. And that was the one recording. So that's how that happened. And then right at that time also, I met Puntilla when he came. And that's what launched New Yoruba, ultimately. So that, hap so that happened like right around the same time when you met Puntilla and when you're working with this, with this group, that, all, that happened like around the same time? Pretty much, yeah, pretty much 81, 80, 81, 82, yeah. So right after uh, Puntilla uh, came up. Yeah, when he came, we all just went whoosh. <laughs> you know, it was like a magnet, you know, because he was it. He, all the knowledge he brought, and we had this so source and somebody wanted to share it, you know, someone like him that wanted to share it and, and um, scope out and scout out what was here that he could utilize, people he could teach, people he could train, ways he could present all that he was about. So, you know, it just, everything uh, catapulted everything else, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 wonderful, you know. And that you know that it, it's it's um, to me it's very interesting, you know, that that was your your first uh, recording. Right. You know, it's very very. Many people interesting. don't know that, but um, when I play congas, I really um, and and the, and the things I learned uh, first were very um, 
uh, you know, um, Bembe, six, eight rhythms and uh, cantos to the, to the orishas. And I would sit and play and, and feel uh, the energies, you know, that which is what uh, propelled me into it so deeply was the spiritual sense of connection to what I was hearing and, and being around. But I want to ask you too, because our time is going to go fast. Tell me, because uh, when I hear you and uh, and uh, Roman Filiu and uh, others from Santiago, uh, compared to a lot of people I've always known from Havana, I've always wondered because the avant-garde, which is you know a name for kind of a name for what some of us do, kind of, but. Uh, I was connected to that through my uh, be, being next door neighbors with uh, a founding member of the Black Artist Group uh, for three years in San Francisco by Keita Carroll, through him oh, I met yeah. Oliver Lake, Julius Hemphill, and lots of folks. A lot of people know this about me already, so I won't go, you know, spend time on it. But um, when I hear you, I'm like, what, what got you so deep into the language that you speak musically now? I know that you heard jazz greats, uh, and, and the creativity that's just a part of Cuban music is is who you are. But I, I just feel like there's something in the water in Santiago. You know? Maybe so. I mean, I I, um, I do hear the, a little bit of an echo now. I wonder if it's maybe my, my system or I don't know. But um, I actually started, play, you know, playing, you know, or, or at least receiving um, formal piano lessons when I was six also. But it, it so happened that I was, I was born in a, in a family of musicians, you know, both my parents are musicians. My, my mother, she played flute in the symphony orchestra in Santiago for, for many years. And she was also a teacher. She taught solfeggio and uh, theory. And uh, uh, also she was um, one of the uh, teachers for, for accompaniment, for piano accompaniment. Uh, so um, that was, you know, it was through, through my family. My my father is a singer songwriter, and he's, you know, he's been writing music for 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 a very long time. And he was associated in different times of of his career to different theater troupes. He's um, written music for for ballet, for film, uh, and of course, he's you know, he's got a um, he, uh, rich catalog of, of, of his own compositions, you know, even though, he, you know, he's he's recorded quite quite a bit, but he hasn't done a lot of uh, official recordings, you know, he has like maybe like a couple releases under his own name for Egrem from the 90s, and he was also featured on a couple of uh, compilations, uh, along with other members of, of um, uh, well, I would say members, but you know, people that were that were uh, practitioners of that kind of music. You know, the, uh, Nueva Trova, you know, uh, which is well, what my father has. Let, uh, let me jump to say that that must have felt just like really full circle to yeah. end up in Egrem doing your latest recording. Oh, totally, totally. I mean, that was there was no there was no other there was no other option for me. You know, <laughs> it, it was it was just natural, and and also I just loved that studio. I really just loved the the <laughs> space. It's beautiful, David, and, and, and um, I mean, I want to hear the rest of that, but I want to say there's one track on that that's just like, just, ooh we we'll get back to it. We got to leave time to talk all that. Yes. But, um, yeah, like, when, when did you get exposed to, I mean, not to, like, cut you off, tell your story, I am listening, but, like, I want to know when, when that turn or that next... Uh, you know, well, you know what? What happened was this. I was at one point. I was a little, um, I guess, uh, maybe discouraged with music. You know, like in my in my early teens, and I was I was always into visual arts. Even though I never, you know, I never really went to school for it, but I was really into it. So I was considering a change of of uh, direction. You know, at that at that point, you know, I mean, obviously, I was very young, and I, you know, <laughs> didn't know what I was doing. But my 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 parents, they said, well, you know, why don't you uh, finish this this part of your musical education, and then you know you can decide what to do you know later later on. So I said okay, you know. So I finished my what they call the elementary uh, level of, of uh, music studies, uh, which is like basically uh, all the way up until you finish high school. So when I when I did that, by that time, 
um, I was introduced to to to, improvis to improvisation through the recordings of um, Emiliano Salvador, uh, of course, Chucho Valdez, Gonzalo Rubalcaba. You know, these are these are some of the things that that I was listening very very early, listening to very early on. But my my parents, you know, they they have very eclect eclectic um, musical taste, so they were listening to all kinds of music. You know, uh, classical music. They were listening to Brazilian music, of course, uh, North American music. You know, uh, soul and yeah, we got uh, that in common. Jazz. We got that in common, which is yeah. why we have things in common. Very much so. Very much so. And also, um, I forgot to add my my aunt. She's a very accomplished uh, concert pianist. She studied at the Tchaikovsky Conservatory in, in Moscow. So, all of that was on, on my grandparents. You know, they were they were huge. Fanatics. My my paternal grand grandfather, he had a very nice uh, record collection, and that's the very first time I learned about who Louis Armstrong was, or Ella Fitzgerald, or Thelonious Monk. Like he he had found these records in used record stores uh, prior to the revolution. So that was really my my introduction. So when I started getting into when I started getting into improvisation, then eventually I got I started receiving information, you know, especially from, from musicians that were coming in from outside of Cuba. They would bring tapes and I would, you know, and I would make sure to tape them. Um, and then also my father, cause he was pretty active uh, at that time touring. He would bring me uh, different things, you know, tapes. Mm -hmm. and that's yeah. when I first. That was the same, like for, for us, because we, we just waited for those, those tapes, those cassettes. Oh that yeah. That would come look. I got los muñequitos. Oh, we did the same thing over here, and then we passed them around like jewels, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and then you know, it was like you know that's that's a real um, like an inner circle because that's not where everybody goes, and the people that are there are so passionate. Like it's like parallel what you're saying from your end and from my end, and you're so totally. passionate because you're finding where your heart and your soul is, and where your spirit is at, and it's like calling you out. It's calling you, you know. Totally, totally. That's that's how I felt when I, you know, when I first discovered uh, Bud Powell and Monk. That was it for me. You know? Two of my favorites, right there. Another mm -hmm. thing we got in common that we finding out that, but see, like if I just listened to you play, I wouldn't necessarily know that because hear that. Mm -hmm. so, it's mm -hmm. so transformed by your aesthetic, you know, mm -hmm. as mine is. You know, how people hear Monk in me, mm -hmm. unmistakably, I think. But but um, um, yeah, your your classical thing is really uh, prevalent as a part of your whole. And I think, you know, like with me, I really came up also with groove, like funk and R&B and, and I loved it as much as I loved uh, the jazz and the, and the folkloric musics. And it seems like both of us just said, well, hey, let everything be a part of what we do. Everything we love. Yeah. Makes you yeah, I mean, I was never, I was never really, I guess I just never really thought about music in in categories, you know, or labels. I guess it was, you know, my. It sounds like maybe you have the same kind of foundation. Yeah, I like what Oliver Lake always said, which is, uh, uh, first the salad, then the meat. Bring all my food on the same plate. Dizzy Gillespie, Aretha, Jimi Hendrix, all yep. one. And he said, what kind of music you play? Good kind. <laughs> <laughs> and, exactly. exactly. And Oliver used to come uh, to the West Coast and stay next door to me. That's how I met him. And he would come and do these solo concerts with his poetry and his horn, nothing but and a drum. And just the horn led into the words, which led into the drum. And it was just, you know, it was all sound. And, and um, you know, wow, yeah. Okay. I, I want to bring up like our... Our, well, I want to ask you about uh, like that beautiful uh, uh, su uh, Sube la Loma, oh my, <laughs> on the latest recording of yours where, where the setting is traditional, uh, it's, it, it expresses certain traditions, but what you're putting on top of it is like, it, it lives there, but it expands that whole, I mean, that one really, really, really struck me, mm -hmm. they all do, but that one just took my heart and I only listened to it once. I'm like, I gotta go back and really listen. 
So like you, I don't know what you what was you thinking on that just to bring some real open types of uh, harmonies and voicings, um, non uh, not uh, unnameable chords <laughs> to, to the context. Yeah, of course. You know, I I um you know you were asking me how do you get into more open in, improvisation? You know, I I feel very fortunate that very early on. I was introduced to the music of uh, Don Pullen and Cecil Taylor. Yeah. So me too. when I, you know, when I when I heard that for the, for for the first time, um, it immediately res resonated with me. So I started, you know, trying to uh, with you know with the very li limited information that is, existed in Cuba. Um, I tried to you know gather some information on that, but I also uh, found out that there was a so-called avant-garde movement in Cuba um, in, you know, before the revolution and even after the revolution, there were also composers that were that were experimenting with different forms and stuff. So uh, one of these people was Emiliano Salvador. And Emiliano basically took forms like the son and the danzón and he, and he expanded them you know harmonically and also improvisationally so when i when i set out to to uh record this project in santiago i wanted to document the music that um that has been made there for for many years you know and that and that that was created there but i also wanted to you know this this is this has been a dream of mine to also just kind of like synthesize many different uh interests uh, musical interests that i have you know like different harmonic things that i that i hear different rhythmic things that um that you don't really find in, in cuban music that are more uh or, or, or are more, perhaps more of the aesthetic of like how a rhythm section works in say like a, a jazz setting you know right. so different things like that i was thinking of different things like that um, if you notice the piece is a dan song, so the form stays intact. The form of the piece is, stays in, intact, but the, the harmonic treat, treatment is a little different. Mm. I'm just looking, we got like, oh, uh, Gail said we can go on over by about, you know, to 540 if we want, but we got about like six minutes. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> it's deep. No, I knew that would be like this. And, and because everything you say, well, this is like what we're supposed to be doing, you know, we really need a part two, but. I want to say, like, when you brought up Cecil and Pullen, like, uh, I I thought I was just busy learning, like, traditions, jazz traditions, where I was around my mentor, the great Ed Kelly, and and um, in the world I was with, where everybody getting together and learning stuff and starting groups and playing around and whatnot. And I think I'm just learning these jazz traditions, but everybody around me kind of seems to know I'm heading in another direction. So there's a critic... Uh, writer there, Philip Elwood, God bless him, that, in, that asked me out of nowhere one day, I didn't know him well, he asked me, did I want to go hear Cecil for uh, a week at the Keystone Corner, thank you Todd Barkin, for all, and uh, I said, well yeah, because I had just, you know, got hit to him on, on, on the radio three weeks before, so I went like four out of six nights, and then I traveled, and I was on the move, driving my van you know up up the west coast and doing some different things and when i landed at a piano i was transformed i mm -hmm. was playing completely different and and cecil had, had really impacted me uh and but then you know i think we feel probably both of us and in our cycles that none of these things are accidental the things that we come across oh, like those records that you happen to somebody somehow you got exposed to them where you can't even get your hands on so much stuff, but yet that happened and your life, you know, just, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I remember, I remember the, the very first time I got, you know, I had in my hands the, the, the tape of um, Delonis Monk, The Unique is a trio recording with uh, Oscar Pettiford and, and Blakey. Uh -huh. and I remember, you know, I remember when I first, had it in my hands, you know, and I remember the, the feeling of listening to that for the very first time in my life. And that, you know, that just completely transformed. Yeah, those mm. moments, you never forget them. You never know? forget them. Yeah. 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 For me, there was um, this uh, Lee Morgan, not that it was the first, but it's one that I mentioned the Lee Morgan record called Delightful Lee Morgan. Mm. And he took a solo on Night Flight. Actually, it's the only solo I've ever transcribed 
completely and, and completely. Wow. So I, yeah, I didn't go to college. Uh, I wasn't forced to do those things. And my thing was, oh, what is Monk doing right there? And let me figure out those four bars, you know, on to the next, you know. And mm -hmm. in this way, I think the same with everything I do. I just kind of, wow, wow, grab this, grab that, um, understand it and keep moving. But that solo of Lee's on, on Night Flight, rhythmically and everything about it, it was like, I said right there, it made me yell. I just screamed out in joy, you know, and I said, huh, this, this is why I want to play. And this is how I want to make people feel, you know, like the way I feel right now, but through my aesthetic, you know, and uh, feeling is, is so key. I mean, you're very, yeah. like, you're educated, you're intelligent, all of that shows in your music, but the feeling, I feel your music. Well, that's where it starts, that's where it starts, and that's where it ends, <laughs> for me, you know, anyway. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Without that, it's just, you know, it's just more talk, you know? Yeah. It's not yeah. walking the walk, you know? Yeah, yeah, and exactly. Music, you could tell right away if it's where it, com where it comes from in that regard, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, because I, I, I have a question for you. Um, actually, you know, while we're on, on, on these questions still, and bef before I continue on with, I, I want to ask you something specific, but um, I just want to mention some of, the, some of the people that I've come across in my development that had like a deep impact in my in my musical outlook because uh, they're also you know they're it's, it's an interesting mix of people you know and, and of course I would have to say first you know my parents the the teachers in Cuba they were foundational you know and then later when I I spent some time in Canada I was I was very fortunate to connect with Barry Harris uh, who you know was one of my one of my teachers uh, Stanley Cowell was also uh, an, another one of my my all time heroes. Um, Kenny Barron, you know, surely who I've met first in in Cuba, and then I you know reconnected with him later when I was uh, living in Toronto, and then in New York, I um, even though I you know I I actually connected with him from Toronto, I really started working with him here in New York. Was uh, Steve Coleman. Was, was someone else, you know, who you also have worked with. So Steve, and through Steve, you know, many people, um, of course, Henry Tregio, who's, you know, he's been one of uh, my mentors. Through Henry, uh, people like Mohan Richard Abrams, uh, Andrew Surreal, uh, Milford Graves, you know, so all, all these people really um, just gave me so much, you know, in terms of, of, of things to, to consider, you know, when it comes to, to making music and expressing yourself through, through, through music. Um, but anyway, you know, I, I want, I wanted to ask you something, you know, cause you, you have worked a lot with, um, within the format of, uh, of different, uh, musical traditions that come out of Cuba. And I'm particularly interested in how you navigated working with with the um, with the auto cycle the 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 ritual uh, repertoire of the drums of the vata drums from um from yoruba land from uh present day Ni nigeria and i'm because of the um i would say because because of the the nature of that repertoire i i really i think that is is very challenging to um to come up to come up with something you know like the the way you did you know to come up with with uh, with a sort of uh, uh, like I would call it like 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 you op you almost expanded the 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 sensibility of the orchestration by by adding these other you know uh, Western instruments that are also kind of functioning as rhythmic instruments, you know, so you have the horns, which is actually, you know, is, is very prevalent all over your music. You know, you have worked, you have worked with, um, with different people, uh, in the past, you know, that, that, uh, you know, like, like Rick Osby and Steve and, um, you know, Gary Thomas, you know, and more recently, you know, people like me, it's an own for you who you mentioned, but I'm very intrigued about how you figured out a way of, of uh, navigating that because the obviously the, the the traditional drummers 
they they have their own idea about form and how things loop back to 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 some of the rhythms you know some of the different uh figures you know so i'm, I'm very curious about how you dealt with that in uh, specifically you know so it was it was a deep deep process i've learned uh this and that for a long time you know yeah. and, and i've utilized this and that so i was to the point also given my path spiritually um you stepping in uh and not take not into flirting with the traditions or the spiritual practices or anything else i mean this is like choices in life serious choices so uh, in the process of being around this so much for so long, I mean, a lot, a lot of years, I reached the point that I needed a, that through and through understanding. So in Puntilla's world, women really never touched the bata. Mm -hmm. I accepted that I got to be in the midst of, the, you know, the deepest stuff going on anywhere around here in that vernacular. And, um, and I was invited at all times into everything by Puntilla because, and he is a member of 25 years featured in my New Yoruba ensemble. So the connection was deep. And, I, and I, I got so much from that. But his godchildren and those who have come since, who are prominent, who are now our master folklorists here, are have a, a bit more open. And uh, knew as Puntia did, he invited me to bata classes, not to play, but to learn. And then the next phase for me was sit on the drum and learn it so you got it because there's no way I could take that out, take that on. I mean, we have the master folklorist, uh, one of our favorite people in the world, Roman Diaz in Congo, in some beautiful projects um, and, and deep collaborations that we've done. And for me to bring something of this nature to Roman and say, here's the new music. First, what I did is make sure I got Roman's Oru Seco. There's, uh, there's, you know, there's different trajectories there, if you want to call it a trajectory. Puntilla has a different oru. And, and, specific um, traits. Huh? Specific traits, a specific um, um, things that define their, their, their language. But also, their original language. also the, I don't think you call it the rama, but the... Uh, within, yeah, their language. Within Anya, the lineage that the lineage of Anya. Mm -hmm. you play to the Orishas in a certain order. And exactly. Roman, and Roman comes from uh, uh, one line, and and uh, Puntia might come from another. So, just for the order, first of all, it had to be a Roman's, and then all the nuance of everything he does had to be something that I really understood. So I I actually took a recording of his Oru Seco live from from a ceremony, put it into Pro Tools, and started listening to it, playing against it, thinking of things, uh, and then when I reached those uh, mysteries. I just had to dive into every one of them to figure out what was going on in Oya. Oh my mm -hmm. goodness, there's some deep stuff. What's going on in Obatala? If you don't know, you just don't know. So the process was really like no other. And it was a couple of years of uh, shutting out the world during those times for hours at a time to get to the root and the core of everything. And then making sure that what I wrote uh, was in there where it should be and not in where it should where it should be not in, leaving room for conversation where where it would get intricate. What do we have to add to that? Why should I try to add anything to that? But if it gets more into groove or there's a lot of space uh, where we can decorate what the oru does, what the bata do, uh, how do we add to something that's so profound? I mean, the, my mission was. Like, uh, really, like always, just God give me every note. You know, just uh, Rufus asked me once, how do you write? You know, where do you write from? How do you come up with this? I say, I ask God for every note. I want the stamp on it. Mm -hmm. So one, this is the note. This is the chord. This is the rhythm. I want to feel is. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that I really, uh, it, it took a lot. I can't, you know, we can't talk all day on it. In fact, what time we got? Oh, man, we might need a part two because um, <laughs> for real, so much I wanted to say about your music. There was one, um, did you see that? Somebody says, go ahead and get started. Oh, we did that. I'm just. Oh, yeah, we already did that. <laughs> uh, so um, 
uh, uh, but you, uh, I wanted to say there was one. I'm looking at my notes because there's one song that of yours that, like the head, really reminded me of Archie Shepp and a record called On This Night. And I wonder if you ever heard it. Mac Man, the Mac Man, and um, uh, let's see if I can find it. Oh, yeah, uh, the Piccaninny, Gingerbread, Gingerbread Boy, those tracks on the record called uh, On This Night, they reminded me of... Um, or your head on Abe, Aberin Young. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah very soon. soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When yeah. that opens, you know. Yeah. And there was one where McCoy, uh, Antilla, uh, Antilla, 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 mm -hmm. Antilla, Antilla, Bandera, si. like a McCoy type thing, but there was like this, you know, like beautiful, like unveiling and progression of, of um, I want to ask you, like, what's happening with the percussion there's like a scattering of time you know it's like exactly. time scatters and it, is that just the drums or do the percussion feed in right there no what i specifically with that piece with with auntie yeah what i had in mind was that um you know how usually you have um in musical form you have uh you have a um like a definite time or a definite direction duration for each, um, or at least you know for 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 some type of music, you have um, a way in which each uh, chord change has a very specific um, time dura duration. So what I was trying to do with that piece was that the time duration of each chord was basically uh, decided on the spot. So it was basically um, I mean, we had we had chord changes, and the, the the chord changes were happening on a um, on a metric um, rhythmic foundation, but the duration of the chords was modular. So we would have different um, every time we would play the piece. We would say, "Oh, <laughs> every time we would play the um, Mateo, Mateo." <laughs> Every time we would play the piece, it would be different be because the um, the length of the of the chord changes uh, individually the, it would vary. It would vary. So that was the you know that was the idea. Uh, but but, but metric, it was metric. But there's there's a part where the percussion, what is playing, and something comes in uh, the drum set, and uh, Marcus I guess right, and something comes in against it, and, and it's a feel like. Uh, it feels like maybe that that nuance where triplets and eighths exactly da, 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 da. but it, it's yeah. like the effect is oh man there's just so many beautiful conceptual effective moments in your music i think we've used up our time uh time I, I is, up, huh? is this what time is it david it's uh, uh 539 now so yeah <laughs> 540 just turned 540 yeah, yeah we just you know, kind of just getting started. Um, uh, yeah, so much to talk about. <laughs> what? Yeah, there really there's is. so much to, to get into, you know. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the spiritual depth of your stuff, I can feel like a, a permeating spirituality, uh, mystery just, you know, like envelops uh, one who's listening to your, to your music. Um, like I say, that uh, the electronics take take you into some other worlds. Mm -hmm. Your use of them is really beautiful too. And uh, I've always liked, you know, electric instruments used a, a certain way. But uh, I, we we were supposed to ask people if they had any questions, but I haven't really seen uh, anybody. You see any questions in the chat? I don't see any questions in the chat. Um... But if, if nobody's going to ask anything, I just wanted to ask something that I, you know, I feel the same. I feel the same way about your music. You know, I, I get that from your music, and that's exactly why I asked you. You know, that question about how you dealt with that specific repertoire, because um, there's just so much more. You know, obviously, this is just there's just so much more beyond the 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 rhythms you know beyond the the, yeah. the actual musical material you know this music that this music has a um uh, a, a spiritual uh foundation well gail mentions here we'll get a part two which is great but i'll just answer that by saying uh that it ends up feeling kind of like musical like theater like i would love to enact it because each rhythm is played 
as we know, for a particular entity. Energy. Mm -hmm. and energy. It has a name uh, in this tradition, Yemaya or Chunchango, whatever. But like, for example, in Ochosi, the way that rhythm builds, which is the hunter, and he finds his prey, and now he's he's pursuing, and at the at the pursuit, at the moment of, of pursuit, the drums, what they're playing, you feel that. So if I'm writing to that, that music is going to express what what is in in there in the drums. Well, Batala is an old an old man, um, or San Lazaro, the age, the the pacing of things. Um, the energies are dictating to me what I write, uh, along with the rhythms and making sure that we're we're always um, uh, promoting the deepest aspects of what's being played. And it's so deep. I mean, it's so multidimensional. Your your explorations with Abaqua, with Roman, uh, Mr. Diaz, we love you. Uh, truly. Um, we're, we're, I, I know we both feel the same. We're just really, really thankful. Uh, so, yeah, Gail, again, reminding us we'll get a part two. Hey, thank you, um, David. Thank you, Gail. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle, and thank you, Gail. To we continue, you know, hopefully we can do this sometime, sometime soon. You know, maybe we can get Roman also to oh. to be to be in it. <laughs> maybe maybe he, maybe he'd like to to join us on on this. And, you know and get a chance to talk more about the things we're doing currently. I got some great stuff coming up. And we'd love to, we'd love to share some of that. You know, I'm also working on, on different things. It would be great to, to share some, some of that with you too. Thanks everybody.